last time in prayer. O oh Lord, for a thousand tongues to sing of our great Redeemer's praise, and for the eyes to see what he has done for us, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you would allow us to see Christ our King more clearly, and Father, that as a result of it, we would be better off and built up into the image of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to begin by encouraging you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Somebody told me, hey, Adam, you know, you should probably just go straight from Isaiah into Jeremiah or something like that. And and I, I thought that might be a little bit too much for us, so we're going to go to Hebrews instead. And as you're turning there... I want to begin our series on Hebrews by breaking one of the rules of preaching. One of the rules of preaching is that you do not read long quotes or stories. You just don't do it. Normally, when a preacher starts reading something long, it has this automatic hypnotizing effect, and it's not in a good way. All of a sudden, you guys start to feel like you're on your couch watching the third quarter of the New York Giants football team losing to the Minnesota Vikings on their home turf this afternoon. You've had a long afternoon after the the church picnic. You're settled into your sweatpants. The eyelids, they start to droop, and it starts to look like I'm at the end of a long tunnel. That's what happens when I read long things. I know this because I've been in your shoes. And when preachers start to read long things, it feels like you're being punched by Muhammad Ali and you're about to go down for the count. So I know that. I know that. I don't want you to go to sleep. I'm going to break my rule and you're going to want to hear why I am breaking it But if you're going to hear it, you have to stay awake. So with that, hear my story. Antonius sits alone in a deteriorating second-story room located in a slum on the slope of Esquiline Hill in Rome. As rain pelts the age-worn wall outside, a plate of bread, some vegetables, and a cup of sour wine rest on the makeshift table. The room is dark with the coming of the storm, and Antonius lights a small oil lamp against the gloom. With the light, hungry cockroaches materialize, scampering to the dark safety of the cracks in the wall. In the apartment next door, a baby cries, and the infant's father screams obscenities at the infant's mother. An urgent conversation rises and then fades as an unseen pair of business partners walk down the stairs outside. Somewhere in the muddy street below, a unit of Roman soldiers are marching past under sharp orders from its commander. Antonius sits alone, thinking. Earlier in the morning, his employer, a rough, burly fellow named Brutus, once again turned from his task of pricing fruits and vegetables to ridicule his young Christian employee. The verbal jabs are almost as annoying as the flies that dart to and fro in the shop's pungent air. Brutus is big, obnoxious, and he's cruel. Antonius cringes against the man's emotional blows, wishing for once he could strike back out of his hurt and embarrassment. Every time he turns the other cheek, it receives a slap in kind, yet he bites his lip, nursing his wounded pride and again He asked the Lord for his forgiveness. Persecution of the church in Rome has yet to result in martyrdom, but since the expulsion of the Jews under the emperor Claudius, Christians are harassed to various degrees by both Jews and pagans. Upon the expulsion, some have suffered imprisonment, beatings, and the seizure of their properties. It has been almost 15 years now. Antonius was not a part of the Christian church at that time, but he heard about the conflict. In fact, his own grandfather, a ruler of the local synagogue, was one of the most outspoken critics of the Christians. At 17, when Antonius converted to Christianity, the old man almost died. Then he declared Antonius dead in a shouting match that ended in tears and a broken relationship. 
In recent months, the abuse of the church has escalated with the amused approval of the emperor himself. And now the emotional fatigue is taking its toll. Footsteps in the hall, a scream in the night, meaningless events that nevertheless set Antonius' heart racing. He was warned about the cost of following the Messiah, but somehow his experience is different than what he expected. In the beginning, he thought his joy would never be broken, and that he thought he would always feel the presence of God. He's been taught that the Lord, the righteous judge, will vindicate his new covenant people. After all, don't the scriptures speak of the Messiah saying that God has put all things in subjection under his feet? But the church has taken a great beating lately, and members of its various house groups have become discouraged. They're questioning whether Christ really is in control. In their hearts, they wonder if God has closed his ears against their cries for relief. Some, in their disillusionment, have doubted, and now they have left the church altogether. Antonius, the son of David, remembers the traditions of the synagogue and the support of the Jewish community, the joy of the festivals and the solemn celebrations of the Jewish calendar. He appreciates the fellowship of Christ's community, but he genuinely misses the tradition of his ancestors. And he misses members of his family that no longer want anything to do with him on account of his Christianity. He watches them from a distance as they walk together to the market by the Tiber River. Some of them still will not speak to him, and they pass him on the street as they would a Gentile. That's hard. And today his loneliness closes in around him like a dark, damp blanket. To make matters worse, he is one of the poor members of the church. When Antonius became a Christian, he lost his good job at a tailor's apprenticeship in the Jewish quarter. Now he spends his days sorting rotten produce, sweeping the floor, swatting flies, and receiving orders from obnoxious Roman slaves shopping for their rich mistresses. Recently, he has even stooped so low as to taking pieces of rotten fruit home to supplement his meager food supply. Even slaves are treated better than Antonius. Earlier in the week, Gaius, the kitchen slave of a rich man who lives in the area, tossed him a handful of overripe figs, saying, Here, Christian, change your cannibalistic diet to a diet of taking a little bit of good fruit. Gaius laughs at him, mocking the young man. To be poor and a Christian invites a double portion of ridicule. Antonius missed the weekly meal and worship for the past two weeks, and his heart has cooled somewhat toward the little house group of the church that he was meeting with. A spiritual urge in the back of his spirit warns him, cautioning him concerning his loss of perspective. Yet, In recent days, he has begun to snuff such thoughts out of his mind as quickly as they come. Antonius' bitterness over his current circumstances is growing. It's slowly obscuring the truth. That night, the believers are there to meet in a local house church for worship and encouragement. Rumor has it that the leaders received a letter from the East. Although discouraged and tempted to skip the meeting altogether, Antonius's curiosity is aroused, and he, he decides to travel the short distance to the neighborhood house at which the fellowship is to meet. Entering the gathering room, he gives his greeting to several friends who also look exhausted from their day's work. A hostess meanders over and offers something to drink and a little bit of friendly banter, but dejection hangs in the room like a cloud. When the meal is finished, the group's leader a good and godly man of about 70, finally arrives. Joseph is a bit out of breath, having come from a meeting with the other leaders halfway across the city. He is visibly moved as he stands smiling before the group of about 20, his hands shaking slightly from advancing age. After a few words of introduction, Joseph takes a deep breath and he explains with the other leaders that they've allowed his group to hear the first reading of the scroll. With a twinkle in his eye, the elder says, I believe you will find this quite relevant. He unrolls the first part of the parchment and begins reading with vigor. Long ago, 
at many times and in many ways. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Well, why do I share that story with you? Why do I risk you falling prey to the the nap monster this morning? Well, the reason why is because that is exactly the type of setting that the author of Hebrews was writing to address. You see, Christians running on fumes and looking for answers, those are the people that the author of Hebrews has in his sights. People that need something, and by that I mean anything from God to encourage them to keep going in what are difficult circumstances. That is precisely the sort of situation to which the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, inspired the author to write the book that we have in front of us today. It's my pleasure to preach it to you because I am absolutely confident that the Lord aims to use the book of Hebrews to speak into the difficulties of our lives. How many of you have heard a sermon series that consisted of at least 25 messages preached on the book of Hebrews? How many? How many? Maybe three of us. Maybe three of us. I personally, I've never heard this book preached, at least not in full. I've never heard it, but I've always wanted to hear it preached And much like Isaiah that we just finished a few weeks ago, I would not have thought that I would have the honor of preaching this book to you. But I, I can tell you this in honesty and integrity, I am brimming with excitement now to enjoy the book of Hebrews with you. I am excited. I am excited for where the Lord has us. And the reason why is because we are going to be able to feast on Christ together from Hebrews. And I could not be deterred from it. And when I say that, I mean it. Let me share a story with you. Allie and I, we were talking last week. She had asked me, hey, Adam, where are we going next? Have you decided where, where are we going to go? You, you know, you did that one off last week, but where are we going now? And I told her, I'm thinking Hebrews. To which she said, Hebrews? That's really long. That's really long. Another huge mountain to climb. Why don't you just do a nice short book like the book of Titus? And normally, I give what Ali says quite a bit of weight. I, I, I want to hear her. I want, if she has a different perspective, I want to take it into consideration. Not that I always listen. She could tell you that I don't. But I at least want to listen. So I mulled it over for a little while, and I came to a different conclusion. And I told Allie what I felt like the Lord was impressing upon me. And and I said this. I said, we don't know how long the Lord has for us. We we don't know. We, We don't know how long the Lord will allow us to have our gifts from Him. We don't know. So why not look at the highest peaks that you can find and you say, I'm going to go and take that mountain for Christ. Why not do that? That's how I want to encourage you to use your gifts in Christ, and that's exactly what I want to do with you. So that's why we're going through Hebrews. I I want to have the kind of godly ambition that says we can do it by God's grace. God wants us to have that kind of ambition. And when I consider the New Testament, Hebrews is one book that if we understand it, if we believe it, if we act upon what God has to say through it, then we're going to be built up in Christ. You can't help. You can't help it because Christ is on every page of Hebrews. He's in every chapter. He is overwhelming in, in, throughout the whole message of the book. And I know it's long. I know it's long. How many chapters are there in Hebrews? Anybody know? There's 13, right? That's, a, that's long. That's long in terms of New Testament literature. I know it's long, but we've just finished a marathon in Isaiah. So what's a 5K in Hebrews? Amen? We can do this. We can do this. 
this book, it's, it's really a sermon. That's what it is. It's one sermon that's given to the early church, but it is going to bless you with its Christ-centered, gospel-saturated, exhortation-laden, old covenant-surpassing, faith-encouraging message. And the Lord wants, friends, He wants to use this sermon to grow you to not only know more about Him, but to know Him more deeply. So that's our aim. As we begin the book of Hebrews, that's where we want to go. And so I, I, I want to, this morning, I want to focus on two things from the first two verses. Here's the first. Verse number one, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So the, the first observation for us in the book of Hebrews is that our God is the speaking God. He is the speaking God. Have you ever had a friend or relative ask you, how do you know that you know God? How, how can you be sure of what you believe? Well, well, here's how we can be sure according to the author of Hebrews. We are not left to ourselves to attempt to climb some invisible rope up to God. No, He is the speaking God. God has revealed Himself. God didn't have to reveal Himself at all. He didn't have to. He could have chosen to remain silent, shrouded in darkness, but He did not do that. No, He spoke. So friends... Don't let that be lost on you. Let your heart be warmed by the fact that God is the speaking God. That the infinite, the all-wise, the exalted one has condescended to speak to us. He did not have to do that. God did not have to do that. He was not obligated to speak. No, it is all of His grace that He would speak to us. And the author notes that God has spoken at many times and in many ways. And boy, if that is not the truth. Listen to just some of the ways that God has spoken in the Old Testament. God spoke to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus 3. Exodus 19 says that God spoke to Moses in the thunder. So think of that, hearing God's voice in the thunder. God spoke through the marriage of Hosea the prophet. He spoke through the names of Isaiah's children. That same God spoke to Elijah in a still small voice in 1 Kings 19. The same God gave visions to prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel. He spoke in dreams to Joseph and Daniel. He spoke through an angel to Gideon in Judges 6. And he even spoke by the angel of the Lord appearing in front of Balaam, then speaking to Balaam's donkey in Numbers chapter 22, verses 22 through 35. So has God spoken in many times and many ways? Yes, he absolutely has. In fact, the author of Hebrews, he loves to go back and call to mind what God has said in the past. As we go through this book, you're going to see over and over again that what he's doing is essentially just calling us to mind the Old Testament and to see how it's fulfilled in Christ. That's what he's going to do over and over again. But the point of Hebrews 1.1 is, as Francis Schaeffer so wonderfully put it, God is there and he is not silent. He is not silent. And on account of that truth, the fact that our God is the speaking God, you can have great courage, Christian. You can have great courage. He wants you to know Him. God is not cool and distant. He wants you to know Him beyond a shadow of a doubt. How do I know that, uh, that that's true? How do I know that, you might ask? I know that because He's the speaking God. He is the God who speaks. And make no mistake, this is the first thing that God must give us faith to believe in. That He has spoken, that He can be known. So if you're not a Christian and you're here this morning and you're wondering... What's the Christ, Christian message all about? Well, really, the, the, the building block, the first building block to coming to Christ is knowing that God has spoken through his word, that you can believe what he has said, that you can trust how he has revealed himself. I don't know who you are. I don't know everything about you, but I know 
that if you're ever going to come to faith in Christ and, and receive his salvation, then ultimately you must hear his word as authoritative and true. A couple of weeks ago, we started our membership orientation class. I, I don't know who wrote the books. I think it was Eric or Reeves, maybe somebody else. But whoever it was, they, they, they were right with their starting point. The first point says, we believe the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God, the supreme and final authority in all matters of faith and Christian conduct. Well, well as smart as those men may be, and they are in very way, various ways, that idea didn't originate with them. Where did it originate? It originated with God speaking. God spoke in his word. And Emmanuel, because God is the speaking God, we get to embrace the distinct blessing of being a listening people. Now, what do I mean by that? We live in an age that looks at the idea of God speaking, and they view it as restrictive and unloving. So, so people, they look at us, and they think that we're weird, we're outdated on account of our belief in the Bible as the Word of God, but that's only because, in some way, he doesn't fit their expectations. And the truth is, he didn't fit what we expected either. Instead, God calls us not to live for our natural desires, but to live for his glory. But have you ever thought that the, the fact that God has spoken is a means of his love for sinners like us? The, the fact that he reveals himself at all, we can know that we know that we know God, not because we think we figured him out, but because he's revealed himself in his word. The reason why the Bible is so precious to us is because it's the only place where God has spoken definitively and clearly as to how men can know God. So we should praise God this morning. If you know nothing else, you know that God has spoken in his word. He has given an authoritative message so that we could know him. But not only that, his word is also a means of stability and constancy in an ever-changing world. God's word is the ballast in the midst of the, the, the storms, as it were, in this life that we endure. Has the morality of the United States, has it changed in 20 years? What would you say, yes? I would say, yes. <laughs> I would say, yes, absolutely, it has changed. Well, you better believe it's changed. I could go down the list of things that were not uh, laws back in 2004, and they are today. But here's a question for you. Has the morality of the Bible changed? No, it hasn't changed. Has it changed in 20 years, or has it changed in the last 2,000 years? No, not at all. Not, will it change 10,000 years from now? No, it will not change. The reason why, friends, is because the Bible is the final authoritative revelation of God, and it will never change. It will never change. We live in a world where everything's constantly changing. There's almost nothing that is stable. There's almost nothing that endures. And especially not our own feelings. Those constantly change, don't they? I'm hot and cold. I, I, I'm zealous today. I, I'm cold in my affections tomorrow. But God's word never changes. It never changes. He is steady. Our God is the speaking God. Amen? So anchor yourself in what he has spoken. Don't anchor yourself in your feelings. Don't anchor yourself in the prevailing opinions of the day. Those things are going to shift like sand in the wind. And believing that God has spoken, it should actually change the way that we come to the Bible. How do modern people come to the Bible? They come to it with a, a level of suspicion. They come to the Bible like somebody trying to examine it, looking for faults. They do the Thomas Jefferson. They come to the Bible, they open it, they find something they don't like, and they think, I'm going to cut that out. I, I think I'll just wipe that part out. doesn't really matter. doesn't need to apply to me. Well, as Christians, we should reverse that. We should allow the Bible to examine us, looking for 
things in us that God cannot accept. That's the idea. It, it, it changes. No longer are we standing over Scripture looking for where it doesn't live up to our expectations. We stand under it saying, where do I need to change? Where does God demand that I would change? And do you want to know a secret? God's word will inevitably do one of two things for you. It will be a word of promise and comfort. That, that's what it will be to the Christian. Or it will be a word of punishment and condemnation. That's what it will be to the modern man who thumbs his nose at it. There is no middle ground. There's no middle ground. It's either promise and comfort or condemnation and punishment. And that's not, you, you guys aren't <laughs> condemnation and punishment and you're not promise and comfort. That, that's just to say it's going to be one or the other. But verse 1, it really only describes the Old Testament. But God hasn't just spoken in the Old Testament. God is not only the speaking God, but here's the second point. Jesus is the final speech of God. Look at verse 2 with me. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You want to know something ironic? What's ironic is that the author of Hebrews, he starts out in verse 1, saying God spoke at many times and in many ways, and then he just immediately goes into how God has spoken authoritatively in his Son. He doesn't even bother telling you who he is. He doesn't bother telling us how he received this message that he wrote to the Hebrews. If, if your elementary school teacher was assessing the beginning of Hebrews and, and they were looking for the five W's, how many of them do you think they would see? They wouldn't see about three of them. They wouldn't see the, the where. They wouldn't see the, the when. They wouldn't see the who. We don't know. We don't know who the author is. We don't know who he's writing to for certain. We don't know. We don't even know when he's writing. The only thing that we can gather for certain are the what and the why. And even those we have to derive from contrast. Did you notice the contrast in verse 2? Many prophets, in many ways, in verse 1, versus by his one son once and for all. Many times versus the final word of God. You see, the author of Hebrews, he's going to contrast the work of Christ against the works of the Old Testament over and over again. And he's doing it to show us. If you want Hebrews in a nutshell, here it is. I'm going to ask you. Six months from now, what's Hebrews in a nutshell? And you're going to say the supremacy of Christ over everything. Let's say that together. The supremacy of Christ over everything. That's what the author's going to show us. He says that Jesus is the prophet to end all prophets because he is the word of God. He is the priest to end all sacrifices because he offers himself upon the cross for our sins. And he is the king of all kings because he will rule for eternity at the right hand of God where he sat down because he finished his work. So then, my question for you, I know that you've heard of Jesus, but have you heard him? You have heard of the message of Christ. I'm sure of that, especially if you've been here many times. You've heard what he has done, that he was born of a virgin. He's the Son of God. He lived the perfect life. He died upon the cross. He was resurrected. Now he is sitting at the right hand of God. He's waiting until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. But have you really heard Jesus Christ? You see, what the author of Hebrews would tell you if he were here with us this morning he would say, don't overlook the blessing that is yours. Don't overlook the blessing that is yours. You have the word of Christ. He's the final speech of God. He's greater than everyone else in the Bible. So you would be a fool not to listen to him, not to want to sit at his feet and to learn from him and to worship him. And what I find profoundly ironic is that God has spoken so clearly but so often people think they need a different word. 
They think they need a clear communication or a, a personal revelation, don't they? It seems like every other, I don't know, couple years, a new book comes out by someone who is claimed to have died and, and gone to heaven and then they came back into the world. Uh, there, there's probably a more recent one, but the one I'm thinking of, it happened like 10, 15 years ago. I think it was from uh, John Piper's long lost brother because it was from a guy by the name of Don Piper. And, and whether or not the book was any good, I don't know. I didn't read it. It's called 90 Minutes in Heaven. And, and you might be sitting on the edge of your seat saying, well, what did it say, Adam? Well, I, I can confess I didn't read it. I don't know what it said. I'm not sure of what sort of revelation Don Piper was claiming to give to people today. In, in fact, I saw it at the bookshelf, and I thought, nah, I don't need that. Why? Because I have the final word of Jesus Christ. God alone has spoken definitively and finally in His Word through His Son. So we don't need other resurrection stories. God has given His final word in His Son. And because of that, it alone is the final authority. And it points to the atoning work of God's Son for us. As we go through the book of Hebrews, you're going to see that Jesus' greatness, it exceeds over all of the prophets of old. And so the goal of our life is to be brought more and more into submission to him and to see him as looming, as large as he truly is. That's why I'm excited for Hebrews, because we're going to see Jesus as large and as majestic as he is. Perhaps no one captures this idea as well as C.S. Lewis. Lewis sums up the goal of the Christian life in one interaction in his series in the Chronicles of Narnia. In book four of the series, otherwise known as Prince Caspian, Lewis, he depicts our funda fundamental need in life. If you've read the book, you might remember that Lucy is one of the, the uh, children in the Chronicles of Narnia. And, and in book four, she sees Aslan at night for the first time in a long time. And if you don't know the story, the lion, Aslan, this is the, the Christ figure in Narnia. And as he appears to Lucy, he is shining and he is huge. So Lucy says, Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan. And she's sobbing. She says, at last. And the great lion, Aslan, he rolls over on his side so that Lucy falls half sitting and half lying between his front paws and he bends forward and he just touches her nose with his tongue, his warm breath, it envelops her and she gazes up into the large wise face of the lion Aslan and he says, welcome child. And Aslan says, Lucy, you're bigger. That's because you are older, little one, answers Aslan. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And in that interaction, Lewis has just summarized the goal of the Christian life. To find Christ as ever larger, to see him looming ever larger, to behold his beauty, to see his goodness more and more present. And more and more weighty in life. To see the rich reward that he promises us. And it's looming ever larger in our minds and hearts. You see, Antonius' problems, they're much like ours, aren't they? Following Christ, it, it made him lose his job. He, he's struggling in his relationships. And now what is he asking? He's asking the same question that you're tempted to ask when you suffer for Christ. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? He misses when things were easier, when he could just do whatever he wanted because Jesus wasn't making demands of him. And to make matters worse, he's grown cold in his love toward Christ. So what is he tempted? He's tempted to do the same thing that you're tempted to do Monday through Saturday, to throw in the towel, not to meet with God's people at all. And couldn't that be the case for some of us here even now? It could be that if you're being honest for your, with yourself, you're here not because you have the greatest desire to be here. Maybe you're here because you know that you should be here. Maybe you're here because you're 
family has told you to come with you to be here. Maybe like Antonius, your affections for God have cooled. Maybe you can remember being younger when your heart was more tender to the things of God. But now you've downshifted. Now you feel as though you're, you're barely moving along. Maybe you're even discouraged because some of your friends have left the church. They've moved away. Well, if that is you, what do suffer, suffering people always want? What do suffering people always want? They want somebody to give them something practical. They say, don't just tell me something. Give me something that's going to work. That's what you do when you, when you go to the doctor and something's ailing you. What do you say? Doc, make it right. Make the pain go away. Do something about it. The author of Hebrews says, all right, here's the most practical thing that I can give you in the Christian life. Jesus Christ is supreme over everything. He is supreme over everything. Everything is his. And what you need, what you need is not for somebody to wave a magic wand and to heal all of your problems. No, what you need is to bring everything else back to size in comparison to the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. I'm going to try to explain what this is like. I grew up in the same house from second grade all the way until I was uh, in high school. In fact, I graduated, and I think that day we moved onto the other side of town. And if you grew up in a home and then you moved away before you were an adult, you'll probably sympathize with this illustration because something weird happens. If your memories of your childhood home are anything like mine, then everything seems so big in retrospect. Does that happen to anybody else? When you think of your childhood home, you think, man, my, my room was massive. My house, it, it was sprawling. It was huge. And, and, and not only that, you can think of maybe even your, your uh, walk to school. I know for me, I thought, man, my walk to school from 901 Southeast 12th Street to, Abel, uh, to Apple Creek Elementary, it seemed like it lasted for an eternity well, a couple of years ago, I took Allie down to Moore, Oklahoma, where I grew up, and I think we had Augie with us, I can't remember, but we drove by my old house growing up, and, and what do you think was the first thing that I said when I looked at that old house? I said, it's tiny. <laughs> it's tiny. How, how, how does it loom so large in my memories? And then from there, you know what we did? We, we drove the drive from my house down to the elementary school, and I noticed it took all of a minute. <laughs> it, I, I, I went back and I map quested it, and it was all of 0.23 miles. It, it took maybe five minutes as a child to walk to my school. But in my memories, it looms so large. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, time, it has a way of making those memories appear bigger than they really were. But, but that's what makes Christ utterly unique. Utterly unique. You see, it's impossible to exaggerate Christ's significance. You can't overstate it. You can't over-exaggerate how large he is, how sprawling he is in his majesty. You see, as Lucy has grown, she now sees Aslan more truly as he is. And he's bigger than she first thought. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. That's how Jesus Christ is, Emmanuel. If we've truly come to know him, then we constantly need to find him larger and larger. When we're able to do that, everything else, it's brought down to its proper perspective. And here's why he must grow ever larger in our hearts and minds. Look at what Jesus is said of Jesus in verse 2. It says, he is the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is God's only son. He is the final revelation of God, and he is the heir of all things. What does that mean? That means that everything in heaven, everything in the kingdom will be given to one person. Who is it? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's why we need to see him. He alone can satisfy our souls. 
He alone offers us an inheritance that is all gathered at his pleasure. It is his. He is waiting to give it to us. And he wants to satisfy our souls in showing us just how large he really is. So for the next 40, 50, I don't know how many messages, that's what we're going to do. We're going to seek to see Christ as large as he is. But in in giving this message to you and even starting this sermon series, I know that I'm preaching to one of two types of people. They're both here in the midst. Those who are believing in the gospel of Christ and those who are not. You you might have heard it said that there are saints and there are ain'ts, right? That's all there are. You might be close, you might be saying, well, I've been coming to church, I've been hearing the message of Christ, I I think I'm getting close to becoming a Christian, I I want to believe, I'm not quite sure, but maybe you're not there yet. Well, if that's the case, well then, you fall within the ain't category, I don't want you to stay there, I want you to come to the saint category, but both of you, no matter where you are, I, I want to give you these two words of encouragement and application. Number one, for saints and ain'ts alike, Stick with it. Stick with it. Stick with it. Even if you don't understand it all, as we're going through Hebrews, my expectation in preaching to you is not that you will understand everything I have to say to you from this book. I don't expect that. But what do I want you to do? I want you to keep coming. I want you to keep coming. No matter how much you know, no matter how much you're understanding, because you are going to see more and more of Jesus Christ, and he is the final word of God. Second point of application. This is for the Christians, especially many of you. You've gone through trials in the last years of your life. Uh, Some of you, this might be true of you. If you knew the trials that you will face within the next year, it could scare you right out of your pants. You might not know. It could be coming, waiting right around the corner for you, and it it could be terrifying. We're going to face those things in life, won't we? We're going to get calls that we didn't expect. We're going to hear news that we can't brace ourselves for. So what do we need? When we we go to stand against those things, when, when we face the shifting sands of this world, what do we need? We need a Christ that grows ever larger in our hearts and in our minds as we realize that he's enough for us in everything. He's enough for you. Even in your trials, may this be true of you. Lord, you're bigger than I remember. You're bigger than I remember. That's because you have grown, my child. Let's pray. Oh, Father... We want to see Christ. In the upcoming weeks and months, as we go through this book, Lord, I pray that you would cause us to drink deeply from the well of Christ. I pray that our image of Christ in our minds and in our hearts, that it would constantly be growing, Lord, and that we would set him apart, that we would sanctify Christ as Lord in our lives, and Lord, that we would behold his glory and that we would be conformed to the final word of your revelation that is Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would do it so that his name would be hallowed above all, that he would be praised, and that he would be honored in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name.